So I, I've always liked to continually move into new fields. I've done many different things because sometimes when you move into a new field that you don't know anything about, but you bring knowledge and expertise from a different field, you move in with innocent eyes and you sometimes you can solve a problem in a new field that the experts have not been able to, to solve. And that's been very satisfying. But also you have to be prepared to be wrong and to look silly because sometimes the experts really do know a lot more than you do. Welcome everyone to an interview of a series of interviews with eminent scientists conducted by the Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science at the University of Colombo. I am Tanya Amarasekara. I am Anne Menuka. We are fourth year undergraduates of the University of Colombo. Today we will be interviewing Professor Jeremy Saunders, who is a British chemist and emeritus professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Cambridge. Professor Jeremy was appointed Commander of the Order of the British Empire and he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society for his contributions to the field of science. He was also the editor-in-chief of Royal Society of Open Science, and he is known for his contributions to many fields of science, including dynamic combinatorial chemistry, supramolecular chemistry, NMR spectroscopy in chemistry and biology, and many more. He has served as the Pro Vice Chancellor for Institutional Affairs at the University of Cambridge. Good morning, Professor Saunders. Thank you for giving us this opportunity and time from your busy schedule to take part in this interview. First of all, can you please tell us how did your journey to become a research scientist begin from your childhood and what inspired you to choose the field of science? Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me um, to, to meet you in this way. So my parents were very intelligent, but they were relatively poor. And they were sent out to work at the age of 14. They were frustrated by their lack of formal education. And they had a fierce belief that education would release me and my brother from the financial insecurity that they had experienced through their childhood and uh, through our childhood. So their key philosophy when we were growing up was that if they didn't know the answer to a question, then there would be a book that did. So they bought me an eight volume encyclopedia when I was about seven years old and I read it endlessly, everything in, in the encyclopedia. By the time I was 10, I'd read all the science books in the children's section of the public library. So my parents got me special permission to borrow science books from the adult section of the public library. In my final years at school, I specialised in chemistry, physics and maths. I really enjoyed the chemistry, but not the physics. I couldn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, for a variety of reasons. My chemistry teacher told me that the best chemistry department was Imperial College. So I applied and I got in to Imperial College and I, and I hugely enjoyed that time. In my third year, I did a, a research project, an experimental research project. And I was also given a thesis topic on the use of NMR coupling constants to study stereochemistry. That was just a few years after NMR spectrometers started coming into chemistry departments. I found NMR fascinating and, and particularly the work of Dudley Williams, who was a young lecturer in Cambridge. So I decided then I wanted to go to Cambridge for a PhD with Dudley and I was lucky enough to be interviewed by him in February 1969 and then I was accepted. So that was the start of my research career. <laughs> Can you please elaborate more on your PhD research project, which was based on lanthanide shift regions back in the time period of 1969 to 1972? Yes, so when I was interviewed by Dudley in February 1969, 
he said to me, NMR is dead. It's boring. There's nothing left to do. And he persuaded me to come to Cambridge anyway, uh, with a view to working on mass spectrometry, which he said was the, the tool of the future. Now, interestingly, that was just after Fourier transform NMR had been invented. And that changed the face of NMR forever. But Dudley didn't know anything about it. So that taught me a very early lesson that supervisors don't know everything. So I started in 1969 with the mass spec project, but Dudley remembered my NMR interest and he drew my attention to a recent paper by an American chemist um, called Hinckley on the use of a lanthanide shift reagent. There was just one paper on a lanthanide shift reagent. Dudley saw the potential of this and he realized that Hinckley was an inorganic chemist who didn't really understand the potential. He wouldn't be well placed to exploit the potential. So I started in October 69. By January 1970, I'd made the lanthanide complex and I started experiments with very simple alcohols. And I, as I added small amounts of the shift reagent to a solution of N-hexanol, which normally has a very crowded NMR spectrum, as I added more and more shift reagent, all these beautiful multiplets came out. And by nearly midnight, late at night, I had a first order spectrum of N-hexanol with all the peaks showing. It was like a 10,000 megahertz spectrum. It was spectacular. And when Dudley saw it, he became very excited. Within a week or two, we published, uh, we sent our first off Chemcom, it was accepted very quickly. It was very highly cited. I was hooked on the excitement of discovery. And I realized that one student who was lucky to do the right experiment could make a big difference. And that moment probably sealed my future as an academic. After I had two years, we'd published a lot of papers, we'd done a lot of work. I had enough for my PhD and Dudley persuaded me to stop working on shift reagents. He said, we'd done all the exciting things and asked me to explore something completely different for my last year. It didn't work, it didn't matter, but it was a lesson in being broad-minded and exploring different kinds of science. Your PhD supervisor was Professor Dudley Williams. How did his guidance and inspiration shape your research work and career, and how did it influence your own supervision style? Well, Dudley was a brilliant supervisor who recognized my potential, and he gave me the support and encouragement to explore, and he trained me to write good papers. The, the relationship between a supervisor and the research group is one of the greatest pleasures of academic life. And Dudley showed us that we're privileged to have an academic family as well as a biological family. The influence and the teaching and the learning flow in both directions. Supervisors teach students, but students teach supervisors. And that's hugely enriching and rewarding. But Dudley gave his students scientific freedom while also ensuring that everything we did was worth doing he challenged sloppy thinking and lazy responses. He encouraged us to think imaginatively, to challenge standard thinking, and to have the courage to work in new areas. He stressed the importance of asking and addressing big questions. And he said that having a provocative, tested and testable idea that might turn out to be wrong was more important than pursuing boring details. He trained us to combine the highest standards of experimental rigor and data analysis, analysis with unconstrained, unconventional thinking and unconstrained imagination, preferably working as a team to solve problems. So, so that was Dudley. And I hope and I believe that I continued that tradition in my own research group. My academic family consisted of 55 postdocs and 55 PhD students in my career. And when I officially retired 
five years ago. I'm still working, but I officially retired five years ago. Almost 60 of those 100 students and postdocs came to Cambridge for a retirement event. And they gave me a book, a family album with photographs and their reminiscences of what it was like to be in my group. And when I look at my former students who have research groups, same supervision style and philosophy. I think it would be very interesting to know about your postdoctoral year spent at the Stanford University in the Pharmacology Department before returning to Cambridge. Can you describe your experience at Stanford? Yes, so when I was finishing my PhD, I decided I wanted to study NMR proteins, you know, very big complicated molecules. And I applied for a fellowship and the committee that interviewed me was very skeptical. They didn't believe you could assign the NMR spectrum of a whole protein. But they gave me the fellowship anyway. And my fellowship took me and my wife, we had just got married, to Stanford in California, uh, where I was based in pharmacology. And my wife was working in biochemistry. And my project was to make partially deuterated proteins to simplify the spectrum and then study the interaction with DNA uh, by NMR. It was a very imaginative, exciting project, but it was decades ahead of its time. And we only had a 100 megahertz NMR machine, which was not capable of doing the project. Also, the supervisor was the opposite of Dudley. The supervisor generated a bad atmosphere in the, in the lab. Um, it was a very competitive, not, not a good atmosphere in the lab. So I achieved nothing experimentally that year. It was a waste of time from the point of view experiments. I didn't publish any papers. But I went to a lot of lectures on biochemistry and pharmacology and genetics and physiology and that informed my scientific thinking for the rest of my career. So uh, much of my chemistry research has been inspired by the biology I learned when I was a postdoc in, in Stanford. But the other thing I learned from that year was you can learn as much from a poor supervisor about how not to run a research group, how not to behave, as you can from a good one. So what are the key things that a researcher must develop in order to become a good scientist? So first, you've got to design and carry out and analyze your experiments or your calculations in a way that is careful, that is rigorous and absolutely honest. You can fool yourself or your colleagues, but you cannot fool the science. You must not fool the science. So when an experiment, look, when a result looks wrong or unexpected, you must check it again and again. And if necessary, do the experiment a different way until you're sure what, what the right result is. But remember that if every experiment, if every experiment gave you the result that you expect, you would never learn anything new. So you should look for unexpected expect the unexpected and welcome unexpected results because it's unexpected results if it's a good experiment that opens the door to new science to new results so you need self-confidence but not too much you need to be imaginative and to listen and to read and be broad-minded you must be resilient and have the strength to go on when the results don't look good. If you really want to make a difference, you have to sometimes follow a direction that other people tell you cannot work. Um, but if you have good reason to think they are wrong and you're right, then you need the inner strength to continue. Um, but you also need to be lucky to have an environment and enough resources that enable you to explore a project that is perhaps high risk and also high reward. 
So I, I've always liked to continually move into new fields. I've done many different things, prompted by a conversation, a phone call from somebody, um, or an unexpected result. Because sometimes when you move into a new field that you don't know anything about, but you bring knowledge and expertise from a different field, you move in with innocent eyes and you sometimes you can solve a problem in a new field that the experts have not been able to, to solve. And that's been very satisfying. But also you have to be prepared to be wrong and to look silly because sometimes the experts really do know a lot more than you do. Yeah. So can you please explain us the importance of model photosynthetic and enzymatic systems that you have developed based on profiling? Yeah, so when I started my research career, back my independent research career back in Cambridge in the early 1970s, there was a lot of work being done on photosynthesis and how chlorophyll captures sunlight and it uses the energy in the synthesis so that the light comes in, excites chlorophyll to an excited state, and then that excited state electron gets transferred to an electron acceptor, and that generates potential, which generates energy that drives the whole of biology. And I wanted to mimic that in the laboratory. So we started to build porphyrin systems with electron acceptors attached and then study the, study the photo-induced electron transfer from the porphyrin donor to an electron acceptor. And ultimately, I wanted to build a model photosynthetic system. We made some interesting molecules. We made some interesting discoveries. But I realized after a few years that we were never going to be able to build a system that was very good. And by then, in the 1980s, molecular biology was developing very fast. And I could see that doing molecular biology on natural photosynthetic systems was going to be a better way to understand photosynthesis. And I didn't have that expertise. But by then, we were making big molecules where we had two or three porphyrins in a ring. And those two or three porphyrins then had a cavity, potentially, between them. So you have a porphyrin here and a porphyrin here. And in between there's a cavity where we could bind ligands. And so I thought maybe we could make model enzymes where we could bind two different molecules inside a cavity, one bound to this porphyrin, one bound to this porphyrin, and then do chemistry inside the cavity. So we made these big dimers of porphyrins and when we looked at the NMR, we found that they always collapsed like this. The cavity collapsed. So one porphyrin sat on top of another, but in an offset way like this, not, not parallel, not one or a, not directly on top of each other, but offset. When we added ligands, we could open the cavity, but normally they sat down together. So we could do some chemistry inside the cavity, but it was actually more interesting to understand why these two porphyrins would come together. So, but before I come on to that, because that's pi pi interactions we'll talk about in a minute. Um, what, we, what we realized as we made these different kinds of porphyrin systems was that we could use a template we could use a ligand which had two or three or four pyridines attached to it to assemble around itself many different porphyrins and then we could stitch them all together and we could make really big molecules. So um, my students Harry Anderson and Sally Anderson made beautiful molecules using templating um, and Harry has gone on to have a very successful career in Oxford, making extraordinary, big, beautiful molecules um, based on the ideas of templating, which we developed um, in the, the around 1990 in Cambridge. So actually what we learned about templating and molecular recognition 
was much more important than the model enzyme results we were looking for in the first place. Oh, it's really interesting. So can you elaborate more on the theory of pi-pi interaction? What are the experimental strategies and observations that led you to build this theory? Okay, so as I've mentioned, when we made these floppy porphyrin dimers, the porphyrin molecules stacked on, a way, on each other in a way that was offset. They, they were slightly side by side instead of one on top of the other. That was in the late 1980s. I had a new PhD student at the start called Chris Hunter, who was very interested in this. And he read one of, when he started his PhD, I gave him a paper we just published on the geometry of these and these orphan diamond systems. And we had put in an explanation about why, maybe why they were, had this funny geometry. And he said to me, no, that didn't look right. He didn't believe my explanation. So this is a 21 year old PhD student starting. I said to him, okay, you go away and find a better explanation for our results. So he did. Uh, and he's a very, he's a very good theoretician as well as a very good experimentalist. And he realized that you could explain the geometry of the way the porphyrins came together if you realize that the negatively charged p orbitals in a pi system repel each other so two benzene molecules don't come down together like this two benzene molecules always approach each other offset or in a t shape a t shape like this he realized that there's an attraction between the negatively charged p orbital of one carbon and the positively charged carbon center of another carbon and he did calculations to add up all of the electrostatic interactions between two benzenes or between two porphyrins. And he showed that the geometry that he predict, predicted by theory was the same as the geometry you observe in crystal structures and the NMR. And um, he made a lot of predictions about... Uh, so we published a paper in the Journal of the American Chemical Society in 1990, that's 31 years ago. That paper has now been cited 5,000 times. It's still cited 200 times every year because it provides a simple pictorial explanation of how aromatic systems come together. You can use it to explain the geometry of ligands binding into enzymes, um, you can use it in many different ways. And he is now one of my very distinguished colleagues in Cambridge. So it's important for everyone to realize it was not my theory. This is Chris Hunter's theory. I happened to be his supervisor and we wrote between us, we wrote a very good paper. You are the author of the books, Modern NMR Spectroscopy, a guide of a chemist, chemist and modern NMR Spectroscopy a workbook of chemical problems. What is the significance of these books and is there any specific reasons for writing them? Okay, so in 1979, I had been an academic in Cambridge for six years and we're allowed to have a sabbatical year, the seventh year we can take away from our normal teaching duties. And I went with my family to the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, to work with Laurie Hall. And he had a 400 megahertz spectrometer and he was exploring um, how uh, you could use new NMR techniques such as the nuclear overhauser effect and so on to, to study complicated organic molecules. I had done some work with steroids, which are very complicated organic molecules. And in that year, I assigned complete, complete NMR spectrum of a steroid for the first time. Uh, I also had a colleague on sabbatical in Vancouver called Brian Hunter. We got on very well together. 
And when I came back to Cambridge, soon after I came back to Cambridge, he came to Cambridge with his family and spent a year with me. It was the early 1980s. We realized that two-dimensional NMR, so two-dimensional NMR had just been invented. We could do um, nuclear overhauser effect experiments. Suddenly NMR was becoming much more powerful. Many techniques being developed for protein NMR could be used for organic chemistry. But most organic and inorganic chemists didn't understand what you could do. So Brian was a physical chemist and I'm an organic chemist. And between us, um, actually, I, I was, while he was with me, I was approached by Oxford University Press. who said, would I like to write a book on NMR? And so we gave them a proposal that we would do an NMR book, which did not have many equations, which was not full of quantum mechanics, but it was full of practical uh, advice about how to use NMR to solve chemical problems. And we used organic and inorganic example. We talked about solutions and solids. It was, it was a very broad book that could be used by graduate students. Um, and then we did a, a book of problems, spectra, which people could use to solve and to teach themselves how to use NMR. Um, and that proved to be a very successful project. And you can go into NMR labs all over the world and find copies of the book. They're still selling a few copies 30 years later um, because it's so broad, it covers so much NMR. Of course, much of it is now out of date technically, um, but it still explains NMR in quite a nice, it's quite a nice way. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, Professor. Uh, so in the autobiographical chapter from lanthanide shape creation to molecular shots, you have mentioned about some happy accidents that happened during your research work has led to new discoveries. So can you please share your experience in discovering helical supramolecular nanotube? Yes, yeah, so... Um... So I've never been somebody who has a grand strat strategy for research. I just like to explore what looks interesting and follow unexpected results. I'll give you two very quick examples. In the 1980s, um, some of my work involved using NMR to look at the metabolism of C13 labeled molecules inside bacteria. So we put live bacteria in the NMR machine we fed C13 labeled formaldehyde and watched it metabolize. And there was one kind of bacterium where we had lots of big signals from the bacterium we didn't understand, which turned out to belong to a biodegradable plastic called polyhydroxybutyrate. This is used by bacteria as an energy storage medium, like we use fat or glycogen to, to, to store energy in our bodies. And it turned out that, that we discovered by exploring what was going on with this bacterium. So we put aside the formaldehyde, just looked at this polymer in bacteria. We made some unexpected discoveries about the biophysics of that bacteria, of that polymer, which led ICI to patent the work and develop biodegradable coatings for paint and for cups. It's really exciting. Um, but it turned out it was too expensive to commercialize, but it was, it was very interesting to be able to make a discovery about the biophysics of a polymer that we'd never heard of, just because we had some unusual results in the NMR spectrum that we followed up and we were able to understand. That was one example. But you asked about the helical nanotubes. So about 15 years ago, I had a very good postdoc in my lab called Dan Pantosh, who's now an academic in, the, in England. And he was studying dynamic combinatorial chemistry. He made a building block, a particular molecule, and in his PhD project in Texas, he had been taught to do a crystal structure for every molecule he made. So he did a crystal structure. 
this compound, just an ordinary, nothing very special kind of building block. But when he looked at the crystal structure, he could see that this molecule was organized in the crystal in a really interesting way, rather like a spiral staircase. So one molecule was stacked, was hydrogen bonded to another and another in a way that made a spiral tube that went all the way through the crystal. And these were then close packed. So he said to me, oh, these look like nanotubes. I wonder if they exist in solution. And I said to him, well, don't forget, you're supposed to be working on dynamic combinatorial chemistry. He said, yes, I know, but I want to study these nanotubes. So he looked at the circular dichroism, he looked at the NMR, and he eventually convinced me that these nano, these supramolecular hydrogen bonded assemblies existed in solution, not only in the crystal. And I said, yes, that's very interesting, but don't forget you're supposed to be working on dynamic combinatorial chemistry. He said, yes, I know, but these nanotubes are really interesting. So in the end, he spent all his time on the, on the, on the nanotubes and somebody else did dynamic combinatorial chemistry. And we just discovered that these hydrogen bonded molecules, uh, assemblies, they had a nice cavity, they could bind C60, they, you know, fullerenes, they could bind C70. Uh, they had a lot of very interesting properties. Um, I'm not sure if anyone is pursuing them now, but it's just a nice example of how an accidental observation, if you follow it up, could let lead you to some rather inter interesting results. You were the head of the Department of Chemistry at the University of Cambridge for six years. During those six years, how did you manage a massive department with more than 100 academics and also continue to be very active in research and publish top quality research papers? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I became head of department in 2000. It's a big department. There's roughly 50 academics and 100 technical staff, 200 postdocs, 250 PhD students, and hundreds of undergraduates. So it's a very big, it's a very big department. So the only way that you can be ahead of that department and carry on doing research, it, it, there are two, two or three things you need. I had a very good team of administrators in charge of safety, somebody in charge of finance, somebody in charge of the building. Um, so I, or I inherited from my predecessor some good administration, but then I increased the administration, strengthened the administration. And I had regular meetings with my administrative team so I knew what was going on and I could say, yes, this is a good thing. No, that's not such a good thing. But I left them to do the bulk of the administration. I did not do very much teaching. Um, I only gave lectures on supramolecular chemistry. I didn't teach in the labs. And I had a wonderful research group. I had very good postdocs and very good students. Um, I didn't have a huge research group. I, mean, I had maybe 10 or 15 people in the lab, but half were postdocs with good experience. Um, and I had regular group meetings. I was very busy. I worked hard. I expect my wife would say I worked too hard. But if you have the right, you have to have good people, you have to trust them, but you have to have good meetings. You have to be able to, but you have to be able to have meetings with people listen to what results they're getting and say, yes, this looks good. No, I'm not sure about that. Um, and you need to be able to switch your mind very quickly. You need to have a meeting on departmental finance and then a group meeting and then a meeting on safety. And you need to be able to keep switching your mind a lot. And the papers, so, in my, so I mentioned that Dudley, my PhD supervisor, taught me how to write good papers. When, my, when I had a research group, I made sure that the group wrote the first draft of every paper. Often I had to provide the good title and a good introductory paragraph, but they wrote the most of the paper. 
And so part of my role as a supervisor was to edit and improve the papers so that each student and postdoc learned with each new publication a little bit more about how to write. And that meant I didn't actually have to do very much work to publish papers. And I had a very good secretary, so that's the other thing. I had a wonderful secretary who could tell me everything that was going on in the department. And she was very good at knowing, um, if people asked to see me, she was very good at knowing whether I wanted to see them or not. <laughs> Uh, so, you're well known as a scientist who has done enormous contributions to the field of chemistry and biology. So, my question is, why did you choose biology or other areas of science to be explained by the theories of chemistry? Well, I think that, you know, every, you know, biology is, I mean, the whole of biology, I would say, is just very complicated chemistry. Uh, it's very beautiful chemistry um, and we can learn so much from looking at biology, um, how molecules behave, how molecules interact. I found physics when I was at school and when I was a student at university, I, at least the way physics was taught to me was too dry, it was too complicated. I've realized more recently that much of what I have done is to use the tools of physics. So NMR spectroscopy and more recently X-ray crystallography, the tools of physics to ask chemical questions about biology. Um, but as I, as I said to you, when I was doing my PhD, I became very interested in, I became very interested in biology, particularly how proteins control the expression of DNA. Um, and when I was in Stanford, probably because my research was so unsuccessful and my research lab was so unhappy, so I escaped to going to lots of the lectures that the medical students were going to. Uh, and that's where I learnt, I learnt a lot of biology which then inspired my, my chemistry. That happens to be the route that excited me. I could imagine now that seeing the potential for improving photovoltaics, for synthetic photosynthesis, um, modern ways of, of capturing sunlight and creating energy or creating hydrogen directly from water, I could imagine if I was starting my career, I might find that very exciting now. You received the Mandola Medal and Prize, which is awarded by the Royal Society of Chemistry. It was your very first award received after the involvement as a scientist. With all the excitement, I would like to know what is the research work that led you to obtain this award? Um, that's a very good question. I think probably the work that I did for my PhD, the lanthanide shift reagent work that I did for my PhD, opened people's eyes to a whole new way of doing NMR spectroscopy and solving problems. Um, and then the very first work I did as an independent scientist was using NMR to look at chlorophyll and the first steps of, of what might happen in photosynthesis. But although it wasn't very successful, it was very, it was a different way of doing NMR, a different way of looking at chlorophyll. So I suppose in, in retrospect, it looks to me like it was, it was quite imaginative and it was, it was unusual. And I guess that the senior people who were handing out prizes saw something in me that I didn't see myself. And now that I'm a senior scientist, I think that's one of, one of the responsibilities senior scientists have is to identify talent and potential in young people and give those young people opportunities to do new science. The, the man who appointed me to my academic post in the chemistry department in Cambridge 
I don't think he understood everything I was doing. He didn't need to understand everything I was doing. He could see that it was different and it was unusual. And he backed me. And I've done the same when I've been head of department. I've appointed people who were doing unusual, different, new things. Um, because that's what, that's what we have to do if we want to make new discoveries and expand the boundaries of science. As an editor-in-chief of Royal Society Open Science, what are the standards that one must fulfill to come up with the better scientific publication? Uh, it depends what you mean by a better scientific publication. Um, Royal Society Open Science is a very unusual journal. We publish any paper which looks like it has been carried out where the science has been carried out correctly. So you may know if you want to publish in nature or science or cell, um, it's got to be the science has to look fashionable. It has to be sexy in some way. And um, that, I think, is actually very bad for science, that, that people are competing to publish in high-profile journals. Royal Society Open Science is about open access. Anybody in the world can read it. You don't have to have a, an expensive subscription. Um, we will publish any paper that is scientifically correct, even if it doesn't look exciting, because it might turn out in the future. Um, we also do other unusual things. We publish the referees' reports. So when when you publish, when you submit a paper, you know referees read it. They may make uh, suggestions to how to improve it. We publish all the refereeing history. So we do many things that are unusual. But I think. A good scientific publication has got to be one where the reader understands what it's all about. I like papers with short titles. I like papers where the first paragraph tells you why it's interesting. Actually, I like the first sentence to tell you why is it, why am I reading this paper? Why, what's interesting about it? And it has to set out what you've done, why you've done it, and what it means. That's that's all. Um, Professor, due to COVID-19 lockdown, what are the hobbies or lecture time activities that you prefer to do when you want to relax your mind from scientific work? Um, well, I have to say that like most uh, people like, I mean, I like working, you know, I. <laughs> I retired five years ago, but I'm still working. Um, what do I, I cook? I, when I was a child, my, um, my mother used to do a lot of entertaining, family and friends, and I would always help her cooking. When I came to Cambridge, um, I met my wife when we were both students. The first, in the first month we were here in Cambridge, she was an undergraduate, I was a PhD student. She'd never cooked. So I started cooking for her when we were students. That was 50 years ago. I'm still cooking for her. Um, and I, I, so I, I do like cooking, I do a lot of cooking. She does a lot of work in the garden and she produces black currants and red currants and gooseberries. And, and so she does the gardening and then I, I do the freezing and the cooking. So in the COVID lockdown during the summer, I made a lot of jam. Um, we go walking, we go cycling. Um, it's very frustrating in the lockdown. We have a daughter in Oxford. We have a son in Boston in America. I have a stepmother in London. It's very frustrating not being able to visit them. But Zoom and Teams and Skype have made, have made life a lot easier. Okay. What are the advices you can give to the body scientists who are interested to study and work in the field of supramolecular chemistry? I think you have to look at what other people have done and take inspiration from what other people have done and then do something different. I don't see any point in following what other people have done. That's hard advice, you know. You have to find 
if you want to make a success of a scientific research career, you have to find something that is different from other people. Um, that looks interesting, that looks doable, and is worth doing. So in the end, there's only any point in doing science if, if it makes a difference. If, if, it, if it influences somebody else, it may be to solve a practical problem, um, or it may just be, as it were, intellectually in, an interesting problem. I've been very lucky. I've not been in my career under pressure to solve practical problems. But what we've done with NMR in over, early in my career is develop techniques that people all around the world can use. What we've done with dynamic combinatorial chemistry is provide a way of thinking, a set of tools that other people are using for drug discovery, for new materials discovery and so on. So I've not been myself someone who has done applied science. I think increasingly now it is necessary for people to do, to do science, which at least looks like it may have practical value. So in supramolecular chemistry, you might be able to develop new materials, particularly responsive materials, um, or materials where you can get complex behavior emerging from simple molecules. So the essence of supramolecular chemistry is what Jean-Marie Lane called chemistry beyond the molecule. So you have a simple molecule that has simple behavior, but when you put an assembly of molecules together to make a supramolecular system, then some new behavior may emerge. So I think I would say if I was starting in supramolecular chemistry now, it would be to look for emergent complex behaviors from simple components that when you put them together, the sum is greater than the part, the whole, the sum is greater than the, the part. But it's quite hard to give, it's quite hard to give advice because by definition, if you want to do something new and different, it has to be something that somebody of my generation can't predict. Because if I could predict it, it's not worth doing. Yeah, with that question, uh, we will wind up today's interview session. Thank you so much, Professor, for spending your valuable time with us. I personally expanded my knowledge on very important research areas in chemistry. Thank you again. It's it's been a great pleasure. It's been very nice to meet you. So to wrap this up, it was Professor Jeremy Saunders from the University of Cambridge joining with us today. Hope you all enjoyed the session. Thank you and stay tuned for another interview of an eminent scientist. Have a great day.